Okay, we've got uh, Eric Harris Braun on the line today. He's gonna we're gonna have a chat about the differences between Ethereum and Holochain and specifically about some benchmarking projects that we did because uh, you really need to back up what you're saying when you say that we're going to be 10,000 times cheaper than Ethereum. So let's get into that. So welcome, Eric. And uh, Howdy. let's talk about these benchmark projects. So if you go to the uh, our GitHub account, we've got a project called Benchmarks. We've published all of this so everybody can have a look and see what we did. And um, do you want to tell us a bit about this Benchmarks project? Sure. I mean, the idea here was to run, to, to create some applications in Holochain that match exactly, well, as much as possible exactly uh, um, the functionality as a bunch of projects also that run on Ethereum and try to find out what the, um, on Ethereum, we can see what the gas, what you actually paid to get that function run in a distributed environment. Right? And so what we want to do is say, okay, and then how much processing time will be taken up in running the same kind of application in the Holochain environment so we can get a sense of what the, about whether we can do exactly what we think we can do, which is produce the same amount of computation at uh, a 10,000, 100,000, maybe even a millionth of the price. Um, so that's what we did. Right, and we can see those actual values because I notice in this documentation here, there's links to the ether scan for the actual transactions that we did on on Ethereum, so we can people can actually verify that we're not not pulling anybody's leg here. This is actually real. <clears throat> for for some of them, some of them were actually done on ether scan, where like we looked at how much it cost to actually uh, uh, use um, uh, an Ethereum based Twitter to make a post. Oh, There's a, a project called Leroy, <clears throat> and so we'll look at that in a one. And I actually paid. I think it was $16 to make a post at the given time when I did it. It's a little bit cheaper now, but that's rather expensive. For, or I think maybe the, um, the, the, that, that was like a $5 to join the, um, the network. Uh, and it was like a, you know, a buck a post. Yeah, that's a lot. It's kind of expensive. <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. Uh, let's have a look at some of these projects. So as you can see on this page, there's actually quite a bit of background about the architecture of Ethereum and the pricing and all that sort of thing. What we'll do is we'll get down to the actual projects. So down the bottom here, we have our first project, which is the ICO whitelist. So tell us about that one, Eric. Right. So we thought one of the things we're definitely going to be doing, in fact, actually, we ran into this when we were writing our smart contract. We... Uh, we're trying to figure out how to do various different computations in the smart contract for the ICO sale. Um, and we kept running into gas problems where it was way too expensive to do the computation we wanted to do. And so we had to keep like throwing away as one solution after another. And in the end, the, even the most basic one, which is um, registering a list of addresses on the blockchain that the contract can look at to know that they were whitelisted so that it can know whether to accept um, contributions from that particular address so as to be able to responsibly um, live up to KYC requirements. Um, this was something we were doing, so we thought, okay, let's actually use that one because we know exactly how much it's going to cost us because we're going to do it. So we, the very whitelist process that we use ourselves in our smart contract, we wrote and we tested here. You can see in our Truffle testing environment, which uses the, um, the address, the, the gas price at the given time, um, it, it goes and it checks and see, sees how much gas it costs um, and then we have the same computation what it would be like to do on approved list we called it an approved list um, how what it would cost in terms of memory and um, and usage on the DHT and networking usage and CPU time right and that cost is just so much cheaper than the gas cost that you would be paying um, in um, ethereum and also that the time for the actual processing is a lot quicker as well isn't it yeah much much quicker because you don't have to wait for the entire network to synchronize yeah. you just have to wait for that portion of the network that's doing the validation on the DHT to validate and that only takes a few micro uh, milliseconds doesn't it excellent right right let's right. have a look at the next one which is the uh, very popular data. so we thought that it would we thought that it would be reasonable to go and write the very same sample application that the ethereum folks have on their website which is the distributed autonomous organization and so I wrote a 
a Holochain-based version of basically the same thing, where you can make proposals and you can submit proposals and then you can have them funded. And so this basically includes a, a simple version of a mutual credit currency uh, because uh, as um, you, you may have seen earlier in the presentation, Holochain doesn't have a currency built into the, into the base of it or into the core of it. That's something that you add later. Mm -hmm. um, so this test has a basic mutual credit currency to be able to do some of the testings. It's not as complete as one that you would want to use um, in a production environment, but it gives us a sense of the, uh, of the computation cost that would be involved. Um, and so once again, you can see what the cost was in gas, um, a fair amount of gas, and then the, the same thing done with proposals. Um, in the um, in the Holochain version. One of the interesting things to note is that there's a huge difference in cost depending on how much data you actually store on chain. So that's why you see right here 10 bytes versus 1K bytes in the proposal that you're storing on chain. Mm -hmm. Right, so, and so in Holochain, how much data you store on your chain is not a price issue. And this is one of the big, big cost issues about the blockchain is that because everybody has to store that data, it's an expensive thing to do. So people come up with other solutions. They come up with solutions around storing hashes to data and so on. But that means that in, in essence, what you're doing is you're not actually running a fully distributed application. You're running a hybrid application. And so that's, that's part of the difference. And, and that's also part of the different difficulty in doing these tests, that there is some kind of difference. But I think the point is that um, we can actually store much more data um, at, at the cheap price because of the architectural difference. Absolutely. All right. So the next one we've got is our social media clone clutter, which yeah. basically yeah, replicates the, a lot of the use cases of Twitter. And I noticed here that you found one that was built on Ethereum called Leroy and actually signed up and did all that. Do you want to tell us about this one? Yeah, there you can actually see. Um, it looks like, okay, there we go. It looks like it cost me, uh, I think I overstated it before. Um, it cost me $1.85 to register uh, my username on Leroy. So that's what it cost to join the network. And okay. each tweet cost me almost a buck, right? So. Um, it's more than that's an interesting. <laughs> that's yeah. It's like remember when SMSs cost you that much money, and that's like the incredible steal from the. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, robbery by the uh, by the telcos. It's. I mean, this is it's not a robbery because we're just paying it to the network, but it's uh, it's it's definitely very expensive, and you know, and then if you look at how how much it costs in terms of CPU and networking time. It's nothing, right? You know, 19 milliseconds worth yeah. of computing time and a bunch of K and storage space and networking space on the DHT, it's not nearly as expensive. No, it's not. And it's way simpler to set up than any kind of Ethereum app. You can go to our GitHub account and download Clutter and you should be able to get it up and running in Docker in a few minutes. All right, and the last one, this is my favorite one, I think, is this sorting. <laughs> Okay, so sorting is a very standard thing you do in computation, right? You can't actually sort a large list in Ethereum. You just can't do it because the action is too expensive to fit into an Ethereum block. So all sorting has to happen off chain. So if you're, and, and so people are like, well, what's the problem with that? It's, you're not doing the computation in the distributed computing environment. Mm -hmm. So the largest element, I think the largest list that I could sort on the blockchain, um, at the time was like a 300, uh, 300 unit element. So it's kind of, it's an interesting question as to what your distributed computation environment can and can't do. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, that the fact that you have to, you have to alter the way that you program just to make your bits of computation fit inside these gas blocks. So that, that's the thing that I find really, really frustrating. All right, well, thanks yeah. for that. Let's have a look at the actual pricing costs because we're talking about you know, how much it costs to run on Ethereum. Let's have a look at the modeling that we did for what those apps actually look like in uh, real terms of euros in this case. Yeah, so it, I mean, in this case right now, when we did the modeling, of course, the price of Ethereum was way higher. It was at that level of 700. And so the, the total amount that we can 
calculated it would cost to run all of the computations that we um, that we just talked about was around 5,000 euro. But so I'm just going to go change the value and change it to you know 350 euro, which is approximately the tightest. That it still is 2,000 euro to run those computations, and that amount of computation should it, it should be almost it should be almost nothing, right? Because that's how it's just a little bit of CPU time. So the question is, can your architecture support that? And what we're saying is, well, it looks like ours can. So our opening price is going to be 10,000 times cheaper, which means that it's going to be 25 cents of a euro to do it. And it seems, given what we just showed you, that it seems feasible that we can do that. And in fact, it should be much, much cheaper in the long run. And the price should drop very, very quickly after the after opening day, because that's not even the actual price. It should be a lot cheaper. Of course, that depends on how many networks you have up there and what the comp how many nodes you have on the network and what the competition is for the use of those nodes and so on. It's a market-driven thing, but it should be a heck of a lot cheaper than, than that price. Oh, and here the gas price is also a little high. Let's put the gas price down to five. Great. It's still, even if it's 400 euro for all that computation, that's way, way, way too expensive. Yeah, that's crazy. So, <clears throat> Excellent. Well, thank you very much for your time, Eric. And... Um, Gladly. Thank you, Philip. Thank Appreciate you all your work. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, mate. Bye bye. Okay. Be well. And you stop the recording. <laughs>